We're grateful to be able to be here tonight. As we have all of this week to this point, we count it a great joy to have been here in this gospel meeting. I enjoy any time that we have the opportunity to worship with Christians, to study the Word of God and pray together and sing together, enjoy our fellowship as children of God and bolster and strengthen our faith as we struggle through a world today that is so out of tune with God. And so I thank you for inviting us to come. And I thank Josh. I know that it was at his suggestion probably that you invited us to come and be here in the meeting this week. And I just pray that good was done. I don't worry about a lot of things that a lot of preachers seem to worry about when they go somewhere and preach in a meeting. The only thing I'm concerned about is preaching the gospel as it is revealed in the Word, doing my best to share the truth with people, whoever comes, and if there is a harvest to be born, that's up to the Lord. And uh, so I'm just grateful for the opportunity to preach the gospel, whether it's a big crowd or a small crowd or whatever. I preach in a lot of places, in various places of the United States, where the number present is very small, brethren are struggling, trying to build the Lord's church. And I just uh, count it a privilege to be able to go and worship with them. I'm grateful to have been with Josh again. I love and respect Josh. Uh, two or three years ago, I was in a meeting at uh, Nolan. Josh was preaching on the Lord's Day about three different places and has done as much as anybody I've known in the last several years to promote and to build unity and peace among our brethren in this section of the country. And I'm excited to hear the results of the lectureship that's coming up this weekend. I hope if you have the opportunity, you'll go. It's going to be a great, great feast, I'm sure, and a great boost to the Lord's work in this place. I'm also grateful to have met Sister Judy a couple of nights ago and then tonight. She's worked in Pitesh, Romania, made seven trips there, she told me, working with the church. She knows a lot of people that we know, and we love them, and she loves them, and they love us, hopefully. It's a wonderful thing. I can hardly wait to get over that in the next couple of weeks. And tell the young preacher and his wife where we were that we saw her this week. They'll be delighted to hear that. So thank you for inviting us to come. And I pray that in whatever way, uh, whatever we've done, I pray that it has been a blessing to us and satisfying to the Lord. I want to talk to you tonight about some things that's very precious to me. And I suppose that just about any of us as we get closer to the time I suppose the obtaining of a crown of righteousness or a crown of life becomes sweeter each day the apostle Paul wrote about it in 2 Timothy chapter 4 beginning in verse 6 for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all those who loved his appearing. What a wonderful, wonderful section of Scripture coming from the pen of an old man inside a Roman prison about to die and he knew it. And he wrote for us those words. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, Peter said this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith ready to be revealed in the last time. When I read either or both of those two sections of Scripture, I see in this two men with great, great anticipation. When Paul wrote his part of these, uh, this uh, reading, I don't see in this a man who is regretting the thought of dying. He knew that he was about to die. But I don't see in that a man who's sad and sorry and regretful that he's about to leave this earth. I see in this a man with great anticipation. He's about to receive something for which he has labored so long. And he's confident about it. And he's anxious to receive it. And then when I read the words of the Apostle Peter, here is a section of Scripture consisting of two passages. The Apostle Paul, or Peter, in just one sentence, covering two Scriptures, or three. And those three scriptures are full of beauty and assurance. He too talks about an inheritance that he's about to obtain. I love these maybe more than I did many years ago. And they mean so much to me every day that I live. When I see people like the brother mentioned in the prayer tonight, Brother L.R. Smith and his wife, they're sick and they're broken down somewhat. And we hate that. And we pray for them. And all of the, we, we have brethren like that all over the country. And we all regret that they go through that. And yet, they're getting closer. They're getting closer to receiving this crown. And isn't that something? Have you ever wondered what is there about this crown of righteousness that would make Paul go through what he went through in order to obtain it? 2 Corinthians, the last two or three chapters. The Apostle Paul talks to us about all of the things that he had to endure in order to prove his apostleship, and in order to reach as many people with the gospel as he could possibly reach. And it makes me feel ashamed when I read all of the things that he went through. And he went through those things in order to win a crown. And I read where the Apostle Paul, uh, Peter says that the Lord has told me that the time of my death is near. And yet I don't see in that a man who regrets the thought of leaving this earth. I see in that a man who's anticipating something wonderful and good. But what is there about that crown that would cause these two men and many, many others through the centuries to go through what they went through and to sacrifice what they sacrificed in order to make this crown theirs? Let me ask you, what is there about this crown of life that would make you want to obtain it? After all, you might... Uh, you might involve yourself in some kind of pleasure that would bring you great joy. 
You might uh, have more money than you do now if you didn't give to, uh, and contribute to the work of the Lord's church. You might enjoy the pleasures of sin. There is pleasure in sin. So what is there about this crown of life, this crown of righteousness that would cause these two men and others after them to spend so much in order to make it theirs? Peter says that it's a crown given to us according to the mercy of God. Listen, you didn't deserve it. We don't deserve a crown. We don't deserve a crown of righteousness or a crown of life. No person has ever earned his salvation. No person has ever deserved his salvation. Paul didn't. Peter didn't. You didn't. And I didn't. If man had something, had to do something in order to merit salvation, he'd just be up a stump, wouldn't he? You'd be forever lost, hopelessly, bankrupt. But listen, the grace of God intervenes. And man is saved from his sins, not according to his own merits, but according to the grace of God. I like to preach about the grace of God. And I like to study about the grace of God. And it made me a little uh, aggravated a few years ago when a bunch of younger preachers who thought they were quite scholarly and so forth, and they thought they'd been the only ones that ever discovered the grace of God. And they said the older preachers never preached about the grace of God. Well... I know better than that. When I was a little boy, I was sitting right there on the end of that pew. You have to pretend that's a pew, but that's where I was sitting. And one of two preachers was doing the preaching, and I don't remember exactly which one of them it was, J.G. Peavy House or Rue Porter. I was a little bitty guy. And that preacher was preaching about the grace of of God. And he pulled out a nickel and walked over and handed that nickel to me. I had another thing. Not one thing had I done to deserve that nickel. But he gave it to me. He was preaching about grace. Well, a few years ago, I was going to preach a sermon about grace and I remembered that. And you know, times have changed a bit, so I whipped out a dollar, and I had two young men sitting back here a little ways, and I knew where they would be, and so forth. And at that time, I walked out to them, and I said, Seth, do you want this dollar? And he said, no. Hmm. <laughs> so I asked his little cousin, Clay, do you want this dollar? And he said, no. Well, their grandpa was sitting up here on the Second row, he said, I'll take it. <laughs> well, you see, all of that really illustrated better what I was trying to get across. We are saved by the grace of God. We have done absolutely nothing to deserve it. Peter says, according to His abundant mercy, He saved us. In Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Several years ago, famous TV evangelist James Robison came to uh, Conway and he preached in the Ferry Center out on the campus of the University of Central Arkansas. About five to 6,000 people crowded in that, in that building. I didn't go, but I heard a tape of a sermon in which he said, members 
of the church of Christ do not believe Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. And I thought wrong James. Dead wrong. I don't know of a member of the church of Christ that doesn't believe in the grace of God. Because folks if we don't believe in the grace of God we don't believe in being saved. It is according to His abundant mercy that He saved us. Let's not deceive ourselves into thinking that we can be good enough or work hard enough or give enough money or anything else in order to receive this crown of life because we deserved it. Peter says it is according to His abundant mercy and it is linked to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter was well aware of what the resurrection meant. He had been with Jesus. He walked with the Lord. He heard Him as He taught. He was there when He multiplied the loaves and the fishes and fed thousands of people and then had a bunch left over. Peter had watched and he had listened. And so he knew what it meant to be with the Lord. And then he knew the emptiness and the despair and the broken heart that came when the Lord left him. His Lord, whom he had loved, whom he had adored, whom he had worked with, was now dead. And the last thing that Peter did before his Lord died was to shamefully deny. Now he's dead. What can I do? I can't make it right. I can't straighten this thing out with him because he's dead. Ah, but Peter knew something. He found out something. He learned something. Now imagine what it means to Peter that the Lord's alive again. No doubt his heart was just broken all to pieces that the, the one whom he had denied was now alive again. And now he is able to rejoice because of that. From the empty tomb we hear these words. Go and tell the disciples and Peter. Why? The emphasis given to tell the disciples and Peter. Make sure that Peter knows this. Why? You see, the Lord knew something about how Peter must have felt. And he wanted him to know. And we see Peter as he comes running with John to that tomb. And when he gets there, he finds it empty. And shortly afterward, they were to say, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Luke 24 and the verses 34. No wonder Peter said that this crown of life that you and I are striving for tonight is linked to forever with or to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You can almost see the despair of Peter disappear when he saw the Lord. He was begotten again unto a lively hope. We are begotten again unto a lively hope for it would be our lot to still be in our sins tonight were it not for the resurrection of of the Lord Jesus. The Bible says he was delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. Thank God for the resurrection of Jesus. It's only because Jesus was raised from the dead that I have a crown that I can look forward to. If he had not been raised, there'd be no crown of life. There'd be no crown of righteousness. When Peter talks about it, 1 Peter chapter 1, he said this, uh, this crown, this inheritance, is incorruptible. 
incorruptible. Now you think about that. Every single thing that you see today around you, people are places. Every single thing you see is corruptible. Yep. Someday it's going to be reduced to a heap of ashes. Because nothing here is incorruptible. I read the story once of a man who inherited a great mansion that he had not seen in a long, long time. But somebody had died and left him this great mansion. And I could, I could uh, as I read the story, I could feel maybe uh, the sense that he felt and the gratitude and the joy that he must have felt upon receiving the news that he had inherited this great mansion. But then the story went on and said, when he went to see that mansion, it was in such a state of decay that it was more of a, a, a liability to him than an asset. He would have been better off if he had never inherited that thing. So it goes with the riches of the world. There's nothing here incorruptible. The Lord has brought life and immortality to light. The foul mouth of decay cannot touch it. No way. We've got a crown. We've got a crown if we're Christians tonight. We've got a crown and the decay will never ever touch it. What a glorious, glorious inheritance awaits the children of God. Our bodies are going to someday be changed and they'll be incorruptible. We'll be like him. People argue and fuss about what we're going to look like in heaven. I don't give a hoot, do you? We're going to be like him. Isn't that good enough? We're going to have an incorruptible body. Isn't that okay? Oh, what, gro what great joy when we have that changed body that will never ever decay. It's an undefiled crown, Peter said, undefiled. So much of what we see in this world today is defiled, it's dirty, it's tainted, it's corrupt. Suppose tonight that somebody died and left you a million dollars. A million dollars. In these days of billions, maybe a million wouldn't amount to that much, but it would to me. And you rejoiced over the fact that you've inherited a million dollars. But then you found out that million dollars was earned by selling drugs to little kids, young people, teenagers. That million dollars was made by selling alcohol, making alcoholics out of people and robbing their families and so on. Or in some other way, that million dollars was just completely bathed in defilement, in corruption. Now how do you feel about your million dollars? Listen. We've got a crown of righteousness, a crown of life, and it is undefiled. Undefiled. It's clean. It's beautiful. It's made by the Lord Himself. And then Peter says this crown is unfading. Unfading. You know, earthly riches have a way of fading away from us, don't they? My lady and I have some dear friends 
who have made and lost a fortune twice. Two times. They have become very wealthy and then lost it. It faded away. My oldest brother and his wife. One time, her parents died. And they had a farm over out in the country out of Truman. And so they knew that uh, that inheritance was going to be divided between her and her siblings. But after a time when the estate was about to be settled, my brother and his wife began to make plans to spend that. And they had their house uh, covered with aluminum siding back in those days. And they brought themselves a brand new Buick automobile. And they were going to take an extended vacation and just travel all over everywhere. Because they were about to have an inheritance and they got it and it was $900. <laughs> Made about two payments on that Buick. Inheritances have a way in this life of fading away. Have you ever seen that happen? You get some money. You have a good crop, you have a good job, you save it up for a while, and then boom, something happens, and it just kind of fades away. That's why the wise man Solomon said in Proverbs 23 and verse 4, labor not to be rich. And in chapter 20 and verse 21 of the book of Proverbs, he said, an inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the in thereof shall not be blessed. And then I remember Jesus. He said this. You remember? Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where the moths and the rust and the thieves... They can't touch it. They can't touch it because you've laid it up in heaven. Charge them that are rich. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy saying, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. Let me underscore it tonight. Earthly crowns are fading Earthly successes are fading. Earthly riches are fading. But Peter says, because of the mercy of God and according to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, we have a crown of righteousness and inheritance that is unfading. I just love that. You see, it's unfading because it's reserved in heaven for us. Isn't that something? It's reserved in heaven for us. We have an inheritance that is kept for us by a loving Father in heaven. It cannot be taken away by all the armies of this world. There isn't a power in all of this world with all of the powers combined cannot take this crown away because it's Secured in the vaults of heaven's bank. And it can't be taken away. I just love that. There's an old song. I know lots of old songs. You get as old as I am, you'll know a lot of old songs. Here's one. Since I can read my title clear. The mansions in the skies. I'll bid farewell to every fear. And wipe my weeping eyes. 
because I have a crown that's reserved in heaven for us. We must not deceive ourselves. Listen, we need to take the scales off our eyes tonight and stop trying to convince ourselves that we got everything under control and it's under our control and we can handle it. We are self-sufficient and self-saved and we don't need any divine help. We got it ourselves. Thinking like that, we'll all be lost. Let me tell you a story I read. Got the paper right here. Eugene F. Souter left an inheritance of $400,000 to his 22-year-old son who was a student at Yale University. Junior refused his inheritance. The trustees of the estate insisted that the son must accept that inheritance. But in an unprecedented case held in New York City, Judge William T. Collins reluctantly ruled that Eugene F. Souter Jr. had a legal right to reject the $400,000 left him by his father. The order legally cut off the 22-year-old student from all interest in the family fortune, leaving him without an income. Now what kind of a fellow would you think he is? If you were to just be asked what your opinion is, of Eugene F. Souter Jr. rejecting almost a half million dollar inheritance, most of us would say he's some kind of a dingbat. Listen. The inheritance that he rejected was just money. But if you live your life and you die your death and you never obey the Lord, you've rejected an inheritance. You have rejected a crown that is of far greater value than all the riches of this world combined. I've preached in audiences where I knew there were men on up in years. I visited with one last Saturday. Have been hearing the gospel all their lives. Have not obeyed it. They are rejecting an inheritance of far greater value than the whole world. I've seen wives and mothers do the same thing. And I see young people today growing up. They have about everything they want. We've petted them to death. We've spoiled them rotten. And many of them are going on into their lives without obeying the Lord. Rejecting an inheritance that is eternal. What about you? Are you rejecting this inheritance that's undefiled, incorruptible, unfading, reserved in heaven for you? But you've got to receive it. You have to receive it. You've got to receive it. The grace of God will be of absolutely no benefit to you unless you receive it. I know a preacher who a few years ago was loved so highly by his, the congregation where he worked and they gave him a brand new Jeep Cherokee. Mine would give me a pogo stick maybe, but they gave him a brand new Jeep Cherokee. 
They parked it on the parking lot right out there outside the window of his office. He named it Grace. He was one of the preachers most well known in our brotherhood who believed that we are saved by grace alone. And he named it grace because he said, I didn't deserve it. I did nothing to merit it and all of that. They just gave it to me. But I, I wondered, when I read his note, I got a note from him. And I wondered as I read it, when did it become his? When he received it and took it down to the revenue office and had it registered and bought license for it and bought insurance on it, it would have sat on that parking lot and rotted if he had not received it. If you don't receive the crown of righteousness provided us by the grace of God, you will never get it. This old idea that well, we're all good people and we're all going to be saved regardless of what we do and regardless of where we live and all of that. It's just not so, folks. We receive the grace of God through faith which leads us to obedience to the gospel of Christ. You'll never receive your crown until you develop faith in God and faith in Jesus Christ. You act upon that faith and repent of your sins and confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and are buried with the Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. You'll never get your crown until you meet those terms. And then you live faithfully all the days of your life. And someday we'll receive our crown. Don't give up your crown. Don't lose your crown. Don't let it slip away because of your neglect. Claim it for your own tonight through obedience to the gospel while we stand together and sing. It won't be very long till this your life shall end. It won't be very long.